Uh, my topic this evening is John Witherspoon, the founding father that you've never heard very much about, if you've heard about him at all. This was the topic of my master's thesis, and I was really interested to study Witherspoon and then grew disappointed at how much he'd been misunderstood and sometimes misinterpreted. He was a Scotsman who had had a tremendous career as an evangelical leader and minister in Scotland. And he came to America as the president of Princeton and he served in the patriot cause being a signer of the Declaration of Independence, the only clergyman uh, to sign the Declaration of Independence. Now last night one of my questions had to do with Christianity and the founders and um, I thought maybe I would talk a little bit about that to set the stage for Witherspoon. This has been an area of my special study. Uh, about a month ago I gave a presentation to the history department about providential interpretations of history and much of it deals with the founding period of time. And so the Liberty University History Department has a statement of biblical principles in the study of history and I'd urge you to go online to take a look at that. It's a very good resource. But the first principle that the History Department underscores is that God is comprehensively sovereign over the nations. And that comes from Paul's great sermon or address at Mars Hill where he says, Acts 17 verse 26, God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now the emphasis here is on a Christian philosophy of history that's anchored in creation, the sovereignty of God, God's overarching providence pointing to Christ, his resurrection, the coming judgment, and the need for men to repent. God commands all men everywhere to repent at the conclusion of the address. This emphasis on a Christian philosophy of history and God's providence is not recognized or shared by historians today. Compare it to a statement by Joseph Ellis, who's a very uh, popular and, and very fine historian in the creators, or the creation, the American creation. Ellis is talking about the founding generation, which he greatly admires. He thinks that the founding generation is something special. He says, if you believe that the last quarter of the 18th century has stood the test of time as the most politically creative chapter in American history, and if you declared inadmissible any explanation for this creative movement that depends on divine intervention, uh, the uh, bolding mind, then what besides dumb luck can account for the achievement that was the American founding? Now the point is, we are going to declare inadmissible anything that smacks of divine providence, divine intervention, or the hand of God. He's not saying that I've examined this and I, I don't really don't see divine interaction. We're not even going to consider it. Now compare that to what George Washington says in 1789 as the United States is constituted under the new constitution. It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly implore his protection and favor, that we, we may render unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country previous to their becoming a nation, and for the signal and manifold mercies and the favorable interpositions of his providence, and also that we may then unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of the nations and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions. There is here an emphasis upon the providence of God as well as some notion of the need for forgiveness of our national and personal sins from a merciful Lord and ruler of the nations. And compare that with the sermon of John Witherspoon, the most famous sermon 
of the revolutionary generation, the dominion of providence over the passions of men. It's preached in May of 1776, just before the Declaration of Independence. It's a sermon that emphasizes the providence and sovereignty of God. It's preached during a national fast day. Witherspoon says this is his first political sermon, but he wants to preach it because the time is right. There's an emphasis on providence and sin and salvation, and actually very little talk about politics, much more concern about the evangelical principles of the gospel. Now some have argued that Witherspoon was too political. I heard a speaker not too long ago fuss that Witherspoon in this sermon was too political. I thought, did the guy even read the sermon? There's no way you can read the sermon and say that. If you look on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see excerpts from the sermon where Witherspoon begins his application emphasizing people to think about the opportunity for salvation, the infinite importance of the salvation of your souls. The words of scripture that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Witherspoon sure sounds like an evangelical, and indeed he was. And this is one of the things that my research made clear, that he was not only an evangelical in Scotland when he came to America, he continued those same evangelical commitments. But almost everybody sounded evangelical in the day. Let me give an example from Ben Franklin, who was not a Christian, um, but listen to what he has to say at the, Continental, uh, at the uh, Constitutional Convention in uh, June of 1787. And he's, appe he's appealing for prayer. And he notes that during the time of the Revolution, they prayed all the time. When they were in danger of losing, when they were in danger of getting killed, they prayed all the time. At the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayer in this room for the divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. Every once in a while, I hear people say that Franklin was a deist. Not so. Now, if you were to go to the portion of his autobiography where it says that he was a deist, and you examined what he said, he leaves you quite a different perspective. In fact, it's a fascinating passage if you know it. He's a teenager. And he said people were giving him books, and these preachers who wrote the books, they were just so awful that they made a deist out of him. Well, he's a kid, you know. And then he said, but his friends were deists, and they became such rascals that he abandoned deism because he saw what wretches people became when they were, uh, when they were deists. So rather than giving a wholehearted endorsement of deism, he says, just as a young Todd, I flirted with it, but it was such a disaster that I, I left it go. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. To that kind of providence, we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace on the means of establishing our future national felicity. And we have, have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. Now looking at this quote, which is a familiar one, you probably heard it or portions of it before, I was struck with how much biblical language and how much biblical rhetoric or illusion is seen. It's one paragraph, but Franklin is so steeped in a biblical culture that he uses scripture constantly. 
Except the Lord build, they labor in vain. Psalm 127, 1. A sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice. Matthew 10, 29. The builders of Babel, Genesis 11, 9. A reproach and a byword down to future ages from Deuteronomy 28, a frequently quoted book of the Bible during the founding generation. Franklin grew up in a Puritan culture. Sometimes he's called a secular Puritan. He had been raised in Puritan Boston. And even though he left the faith, the language and rhetoric and cadences and resonance of biblical language stuck with him. And whether he was just doing what came natural to him, or as a crafty communicator, he was using language that he knew would resonate with his audience. Whatever the purpose, he has Bible-packed rhetoric and language in this speech. Do you know what the most cited book of the Revolutionary Period was? People have actually studied this. They've gone through and taken excerpts, you know, from all these speeches, seen who was quoting what, when. And if you say the Bible, you're right. But even more particularly, it is the book of Deuteronomy, a passage of scripture, a book of the Bible that is heavy with themes of government, which obviously mattered a lot to people of the revolutionary generation. And so if you read a high school textbook today, if you see reference to an author that had tremendous impact in the founding generation, it's probably John Locke, and certainly Locke was influential. Or Montesquieu, and certainly Montesquieu was influential. But where's reference to the Bible? Where's reference to the book of Deuteronomy? Franklin here just instinctively begins to throw out biblical images and illusion. In fact, I would say that members of the founding generation were anchored in reformational principles of government. They certainly knew Locke, they knew other theorists, they knew various philosophers. They were familiar with a classical Republican tradition, all of that's true. But they were also familiar with reformational, covenantal principles of government. I would highly recommend for you a, an excellent little book by Doug Kelly entitled The Emergence of Liberty in the Modern World, where he talks about the experience with liberties and rights arising from the Protestant Reformation in Switzerland, in Huguenot France, in Puritan England, in Presbyterian Scotland, and then during the American War for Independence. Doug Kelly teaches at uh, Reformed Theological Seminary uh, in uh, Charlotte. A wonderful book, The Emergence of Liberty in the Modern World, to see something of these themes. Now, with this as sort of a foundation, let's turn our attention to John Witherspoon. And I first want to talk about John Witherspoon <clears throat> and his Scottish career. Witherspoon had a long... Scottish religious heritage. His ancestry goes back all the way to John Knox, although they say that's not proven and that's not for sure. Shortly after finishing my master's thesis, I was visiting my in-law's church and my mother-in-law introduced me to a woman who was a direct descendant of John Witherspoon and she proudly noted that the family went all the way back through John Knox. And having just completed these studies, I helpfully added that I knew that wasn't proven for sure, but I knew that there was a long tradition about that. And the woman helpfully explained to me that, no, they were descended from uh, John Knox, and I have no problem at all saying that my favorite Scotsman is directly descended from my other favorite Scotsman. And so now I say he was descended from John Knox, and well, I can't prove it, I have it on very good authority. <laughs> Studied in Scotland, his master's at Edinburgh, doctorate from St. Andrew, 
uh, successful patrots, uh, pa pastorates in the evangelical district of Scotland and became a leader of Scottish evangelicals. And this is where the story becomes so interesting. The evangelical party in Scotland was called the Popular Party. And the liberals were called the Moderates. And as Witherspoon was involved in this fight, this ecclesiastical fight, he was concerned about two things, ecclesiastical tyranny and liberalism or moderate theology. His most famous work regarding this is Ecclesiastical Characteristics, 1753. And your packet of material has excerpts from uh, Witherspoon's Ecclesiastical Characteristics. What first induced me to write was a deep concern for the declining interest of religion in the Church of Scotland, mixed with some indignation at what appeared to me a strange abuse of church authority. So his concerns, first declension, declining religious interest, declining vitality, e erosion of orthodoxy, as well as power hungry church machinery, a strange abuse of church authority. Those of you who know ecclesiastical characteristics remember that it's a kind of satire. And so here you have in this piece of satire a seasoned, liberal, moderate theologian coaching a young, moderate pastor and about how to be really liberal in his sentiments. It's kind of like the screw tape letters, if you've ever read that, where you've got the, the old demon coaching the young demon on how really to, to challenge people and mess up their lives. And here are some sample maxims. Maxim three, it is a necessary part of the character of a moderate man never to speak of the confession of faith, but with a sneer to give sly hints that he does not thoroughly believe it and to make the word orthodoxy a term of contempt and reproach. Now this is in the mid 18th century. Oh, the confession of faith. Um, I was talking to uh, a philosopher who is a, a leading expert, maybe the leading world expert on David Hume, the Scottish skeptical philosopher. And he told me at one time in Hume's career, he was trying to get a job at the University of Edinburgh. He said, but it was a little tricky because to get a job there, you had to subscribe the Westminster Confession of Faith. You had to show that you're a good Scot, a good Presbyterian, and you'd subscribe it. I was just astonished. I said, you, you mean David Hume would have subscribed the Westminster Standards? And he said, Oh, yeah. He said, you know how the Scots did it back then. They'd cross their fingers and say, oh, yeah, we agree with it. Well, that's a moderate influence, right? But we don't really believe it. We might sign off on it, but we don't care. Maxim 12. As to the world in general, a moderate man is to have a great charity for atheists and deists and principle and for persons that are loose and vicious in their practice, but not at all for those that have a high profession of religion and a great pretense to strictness in their walk and conversation. Puritan types, nothing to do with them, but someone who's guilty of good-natured vices or is a little loose in their principles, that would be fine. A good preacher. Now, we just heard about good Puritan preaching. This is good moderate preaching. A good preacher must not only have all the above and subsequent principles of moderation in him as the source of everything that is good, but must over and over have the following special marks and signs of a talent for preaching. One, his subjects must be confined to social duties, right? Just morals and social, social things. Two, he must recommend them only from rational considerations and advantages in the present life without any regard to a future state of a more extended self-interest. Third, his authorities must be drawn from heathen, heathen writers, none or as few as possible from scripture. And four, he must be very unacceptable 
to the common people. And this was one of the issues with the moderates. <clears throat> they would sometimes force unacceptable people onto uh, congregations. And the congregations didn't want this fancy pants preacher who was guilty of loose living and cared nothing for the Bible, but they were powerless to deny that person coming. Uh, the moderate, the coach says, must be unacceptable to the common people. Or, listen to this language about confessional subscription. In the Presbyterian Church in America, about 20 years ago, there was a, a big deal about confessional subscription. And so if you read this from ecclesiastical characteristics, it reminds you so much of what contemporary Presbyterians were arguing about a few years ago. The confession of faith, which we are now all laid under the disagreeable necessity to subscribe, was framed in time of hot religious zeal, and therefore it can hardly be supposed to contain anything agreeable to our sentiments in these cool and refreshing days of moderation. <laughs> so true is this, that I do not remember to have heard any moderate man speak well of it or recommend it. <laughs> Upon this head, some may be ready to object that if the confession of faith be built upon the sacred scriptures then, change what will, it cannot, as the foundation upon which it rests, but remains always firm and the same. And you know, that's what a, a truly orthodox person says. We love our doctrinal standards. We love the confession because it summarizes the pure, perfect, inerrant, enduring principles of God's word. We love it not because of it's an authority in and of itself, but because it represents the teaching of something eternal in Scripture. And so this is the orthodox man offering this objection. And the response, but who are the persecutors of the inimitable heretics among ourselves? Who but the admirers of this antiquated composition who pin their faith to other men's sleeves. And because they persecute the heretics, we, we want nothing to do with this uh, confession. Now, Witherspoon attracted a firestorm. And so the liberals were mad at him, and he was in trouble, and some of his friends kind of chickened out. They didn't want to face all the heat that Witherspoon was facing. And so finally, Witherspoon came up with a serious apology for the ecclesiastical characteristics, where he describes what he's doing and describes his concerns. And it closes in a way which, to my mind, is exhilarating. Because Witherspoon closes by saying, the situation of the Church of Scotland here in the 1760s is pitiful. But the Lord can change it. Listen to his closing lines. Nothing is impossible to the power of God. I add that the most remarkable times of the revival of religion in this part of the United Kingdom immediately succeeded times of the greatest apostasy when truth seemed to be fallen in the street. <laughs> it's been bad before. But the Lord is able to accomplish something good. Nothing is impossible with the power of God. And then the last lines. This was the case immediately before 1638 in the National Covenant. Corruption in doctrine, looseness in practice, and slavish submission in politics had overspread the Church of Scotland, and yet in a little time she appeared in greater purity and at greater dignity than ever before or since. Let no Christian, therefore, give way to desponding thoughts. We plead from its ruins. Excite us to pray, but encourage us to hope for its speedy revival. You know, there's something that's pretty fresh and contemporary about that language. And so if you're like me and sometimes you get a little discouraged looking at the state of the world or the state of a particular denomination or 
the state of a particular church. It's so easy to be discouraged. But Witherspoon's dramatic and encouraging conclusion is that we plead from its ruins. From its depressed state, we know that God can do the impossible and bring revival. And let this pitiful state excite us to prayer and encourage us in what the Lord can accomplish. So let me just sum up his Scottish career. He is a descendant of John Knox. I can't prove it, but I've got it on good authority. He's got this great legacy from the National Covenant, a legacy from the Solemn League and Covenant. His great-grandfather was a signer of the Covenants. He frequently references the killing times in the late 17th century. I mentioned that in an earlier address, the, the killing times where so many thousands in Scotland were persecuted in the later reign of the Stuarts. He values Scotland's Christian heritage, but he increasingly emphasizes the Christian promise of America. And many of the evangelical Scots were saying, you know, things are bad here in Scotland, but, but look at the promise in America. Look at the revivals in America. Look what the Lord might accomplish. And that would eventually, I think, play into Switherspoon's coming to America. And it took a long time for the Presbyterians to lure him to America. Mrs. Witherspoon did not want to leave, but it took a while for leading Americans to persuade him to come. Some heavyweights were involved in recruiting him to come to America, and finally he said yes. And so let me talk about his career as an educator, which is unparalleled. I have a list here of some of Princeton's earliest presidents, and the one thing that the early presidents had in common is that they all died young, or so it seemed, and they didn't last very long. And we saw some examples of that, you know, with Jonathan Edwards. They would come, good men come, and then die. And so Witherspoon, who had a long presidency in Princeton, surpassed all of his predecessors combined. And then after he died, his son-in-law took over. And there's a mixed story there, and so I may save that for a little bit later. I'm not altogether happy with Samuel Stanhope Smith, but it was Witherspoon's son-in-law. And then his, um, his disciple, Ashabel Green, uh, served as president of Princeton as well. Witherspoon had a long tenure in Princeton and really stabilized the college and provided continuity and consistency. His student record, what was accomplished by the graduates of this small school, is absolutely outstanding. One president of the United States, and James Madison, who was very much influenced by Witherspoon, and after he graduated, stayed and did some special studies with Witherspoon. A vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr Jr., but we won't say too much about him. <laughs> U.S. Secretary of State, 10 U.S. cabinet members, 29 U.S. representatives, 21 U.S. senators, three U.S. Supreme Court judges, 56 state legislators, six members of the Constitutional Convention, including James Madison, father of the Constitution, and so influential, who had been guided in his studies by Witherspoon, and 13 college presidents. And this is significant because the Princeton model was replicated in the South and in the West. And because Presbyterians were so involved in education, the impact on the nation was, is really difficult to, to uh, overestimate. Tremendous influence. Really humbling when you think about what one person was able to do. Uh, the Presbyterian minister in New York, John Rogers, had been influential in appealing to Witherspoon to come over. And he said, by coming here to this growing country, you will have a chance of training young people for the future, you will have a chance of impacting the Church of Jesus Christ, and you will have a chance of guiding the interests of Christian liberty, of, of liberty. And for Witherspoon, who was so concerned about tyranny, those three things, I think, spoke to him. And he certainly had this kind of career at Princeton. Now, here's a picture of Scott, uh, a statue of 
Witherspoon in Scotland. They say he, his significance there is even less understood. He was a Scottish pastor, an American patriot, and an unappreciated founder. One of the most recent books on Witherspoon talks about the, the sad story of the Witherspoon statue from 1976 because there had been a Witherspoon memorial in Washington, D.C., parked outside of a church, but the church was torn, torn down. They didn't know what to do with the statue. And then people said, well, if we use government money to relocate the statue, is that a conflict of church and state? Oh, ho, hum. What, what are we going to do? And do we really want to keep the statue anyways? Poor John Witherspoon, so misunderstood and so underappreciated. Let me talk a little bit about his patriotism. Witherspoon's Princeton was a patriot school. In fact, British observers called it a seedbed of sedition. I realize this isn't an endorsement, but you realize the source. And one British observer said that the students were filled with Cameronian principles. Now, Richard Cameron, the Lion of the Covenant, was a Scottish covenanter. Witherspoon was not a Scottish covenanter, but for this British observer, it meant that there were a bunch of troublemakers there, these covenanters, who knows what's going to happen with, uh, with these people. John Adams called him a son of liberty, a high son of liberty. He served on a committee of correspondence in the early days of the resistance movement. He served in the New Jersey legislature where oftentimes he did battle with the governor who was Benjamin Franklin's illegitimate son. He served in the Continental Congress where he spoke in favor of independence and was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. The old story was that he gave a key address for independence having ridden in all night long uh, into Philadelphia and coming in in a mud spattered riding outfit spoke in favor of independence. Maybe the story's true, maybe not. I have it on good authority that it's true. We'll just leave it at that. But he did give a speech where someone said he wasn't sure that the time was ripe for independence. And Witherspoon stood up and said he was sure that it was ripe and almost rotten for the want of independence. It was ripe and past ripe. He served in the U.S. Congress. He helped ratify the U.S. Constitution. He could have been at the Constitutional Convention, but he had committed his time to helping the new Presbyterian Church getting organized, the new National Presbyterian Church. The British thought that he was behind it all. When the British were looking at the American Revolution, their conviction is that it was Witherspoon. He was burned in effigy, or his figure, his effigy was burned. There were little poems, one loyalist poem ending with the lines, I'd rather be a dog than Witherspoon. Blah, 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 blah. I'd rather be a dog than Witherspoon. Listen to what Adam Ferguson, who was head of the official British peace delegation in 1778, had to say about Witherspoon. Now, this is after the peace at Saratoga. So if you remember the Revolutionary War history, Britain had lost a whole army. They're looking at ways of trying to end the conflict. They send over this peace delegation. And Andrew Ferguson said, it is the fashion to say we've lost America. I am in great hopes that nothing will be lost, not even the continent of North America. There are about 150,000 with Johnny Witherspoon at their head against us and the rest for us. If proper steps are taken, we should reduce Johnny Witherspoon. He was in college with Witherspoon, and hence the Johnny Witherspoon. They had known each other, you know, going way back. If we take the right steps, we will reduce Johnny Witherspoon to the small support of Franklin Adams or two or three more of the most abandoned villains in the world but I tremble at the thought of their cunning and determination against us. Now, this language seems really strange to us, and in fact, maybe they overestimated, you know, the operational involvement in, of Witherspoon. But I think in the back of many minds, there's this sense that there's trouble in the Americas, and if there's trouble, 
figure out where the Scots are. Where are the Scots-Irish? That's going to be where the trouble is, and Witherspoon's the most identifiable Scotsman. Uh, that must be the case. But in all of this, I think most of us don't understand the long history of Scottish political theory, including an emphasis on covenants and rights and the rule of law. Uh, let me draw your attention to a sermon. Stephen Case he writes on Scottish heroes, if you were, a sermon entitled Defensive Arms Vindicated 1783. This is available online. If you have the courage to slog through a very old and very long and very detailed address, you will find out some fascinating information about the antecedents of American liberty. Because Case, and it's really not a sermon, it's more of an address, but he goes through all of the antecedents for American liberty. And there are some classical antecedents, all kinds of Bible antecedents. So you read this and you think, wow, I don't remember these people in the Bible, but you look it up and sure enough, there they are, you know, fighting against tyranny. And there are some philosophers that are mentioned in medieval theologians. I mean, it's a pretty comprehensive list, but the first ones that Case emphasizes are Scottish writers. So there's a reference to Robert Woodrow, the history of the Church of Scotland from the Restoration to the Revolution. William Cruikshanks, the history of the state and suffering of the Church of Scotland from the Restoration to the Revolution. George Buchanan's on the law of kingship among the Scots. Samuel Rutherford, Lex Rex. James Stewart, a covenanter who authored a couple of different political tracts during the late 17th century, and John Knox. Knox's work, particular work, isn't listed, but when Case refers to it, he refers to it by page, which means that either he has Knox open before him as he's writing things, or, as was common in classical education at the time, people would actually memorize, you know, the bits and pieces and maybe the page where it was found. So the work isn't specified, but the page numbers are given. And so in coming up with a theory of resistance or defensive arms vindicated, the first ones on this parade of authors are Scottish writers. And, of course, Witherspoon fits into that background. Here's one example of these books. So this is um, Cruikshank's book, The History of the State and Suffering of the Church of Scotland from the Restoration to the Revolution from 1660 to 1689, which includes the killing times when thousands of Scottish Presbyterians were put to death during the reigns of Charles II and James II. I don't know if you can read it on the PowerPoint, but can you see who, whose copy of this book it is? John Adams. All right, so there's something that this material was getting around. Here's George Buchanan's On the Law of Kingship Among the Scots, originally published in the 16th century in Scotland republished in the 18th century in Philadelphia. You say, why would someone publish this really difficult text in Pennsylvania just before the American Revolution about the law of Scottish kingship? Well, the reason for it is there's a lot of Scots and Scots-Irish in Pennsylvania, and they were interested in the wisdom of the past about how far a king could go and what the limits of monarchical authority was. Now all of this leads me up, and I confess I've got a little Scottish ancestry, so my heart beats a little quicker as I discuss this. And If you were to tell me on good authority that my family tree went back to John Knox, I would be excited about that. <laughs> There's no proof, but I would be excited if you told me that. 
1998, the U.S. Senate said the Declaration of Arbroath, the Scottish Declaration of Independence from 1320, uh, and the American Declaration of Independence was modeled on that inspirational document. Whereas this resolution honors the major role that Scottish Americans played in the founding of this nation, such as the fact that almost half the signers of the Declaration of Independence were of Scottish descent, the governors of nine of the original 13 states were of Scottish ancestry, and Scottish Americans successfully helped shape this country in its formative years and guide this nation through its most troubled times. Now, that's good enough for the U.S. Senate. It's good enough for me. How many of you know the Declaration of Arbroath? Oh, see, the U.S. Senate would want you to know more about that. And here is a copy of the Declaration of Ar Arbroath from the days of Robert the Bruce. I have not seen any direct connection or evidence, but I'm taking the U.S. Senate as good authority that this is in fact so, that the Declaration of Arbroath must have influenced the U.S. Declaration of Independence. Concerning Robert the Bruce, and it's a fascinating document, right? These Scots in the early 14th century go back and they talk about St. Andrew who brought the gospel to Scotland. And they kind of call out the Pope. The Pope was taking the side of the English in the struggle against Scotland. And they tell the Pope that he's messing in the wrong fight. They don't say it quite like that, but he's messing in the wrong fight. And if bloodshed comes, that blood's going to be on his head. And then they talk about Scottish rights and freedoms. Him too, Robert the Bruce, by divine providence, his right of succession according to our laws and customs, which we shall maintain to the death, and the due consent and assent of us all have made our prince and king. Right? And so why is he king? A variety of reasons, including due consent and assent of us all. To him is to the man by whom salvation has been wrought unto our people, we are bound both by law and his merits that our freedom may still be maintained. And by him come what may we mean to stand. Yet if he should give up what he has begun and agree to make us or our kingdom subject to the king of England or to the English, we should exert ourselves at once to drive him out as our enemy and a subverter of his own rights and ours, and to make some other man who was well able to defend us our king. In other words, a right of recall, right? We ascended to him becoming king. He's got a job to do. If he doesn't do his rightful job, he's gone. We'll get somebody else. For as long as but a hundred of us remain alive, neither will we on any conditions be brought under English rule. It is in truth not for glory, nor riches, nor honor that we are fighting, but for freedom, for that alone which no honest man gives up, but with life itself. Now, I love the Declaration of Arbroath, and I love this Scottish political heritage. The thing I want to emphasize to you is that you see the sense of constitutions, popular assent, the right of recall, limited monarchy, long before John Locke, long before uh, modern Whiggish theorists. And these principles affirmed by the Protestant Reformation and covenant thinking became very popular in Scotland. Now let me talk about a few other things concerning Witherspoon. One, Witherspoon the philosopher. Historians of philosophy argue that Witherspoon had a tremendous impact on American intellectual history by the introduction and encouragement of Scottish realism or Scottish common sense philosophy. And this argument becomes, uh, can become very, very heated and I think it's oftentimes misunderstood uh, Witherspoon oftentimes employed certain Scottish realist points, but for him, I think common sense had an apologetics function, right? So he's using language and discourse that people understood, and he's moving the discussion along. Later figures, like Samuel Stanhope Smith, move beyond Witherspoon. That being said, Witherspoon criticized 
Scottish realist philosophers when they were out of accord with scripture. He emphasized human depravity. He stressed the need for salvation through Christ. He emphasized scriptural authority and inerrancy. I've read a number of writers that said, you know, the Scottish realists emphasized sort of an innate human sense, moral judgments, and so they elevated that above scripture. And Witherspoon was sympathetic to Scottish realism, which meant that Witherspoon didn't value scripture that much. Just not so. Let me give some examples. And if you read his messages, if you read his sermons, his thinking is going to be much more clear. Scripture he calls an unerring standard. And this is long before inerrancy as a theological term is uh, defined or commonly used. Let not human understanding be put in the balance with divine wisdom. Reason for Witherspoon always had to be subordinate to the word of God. It had value in corroborating things in scripture and in inducing men to believe other truths in scripture. But listen to what he says. If the testimony of God in scripture is to be rested on, this one passage is sufficient. Right? If it's in scripture, that's enough for us. But the unbelieving heart is ready to challenge and call into question every such scripture declaration. Therefore, I shall first briefly lay before you some of the scripture declaration on this subject, and secondly, confirm them from experience the visible standard of the world and the testimony of our hearts. All right, and so here's scripture, that's sufficient, but here are corroborating evidences that might speak to someone. I don't know if Van Til would have entirely approved of that, but this is Witherspoon's methodology, and the most important thing was his emphasis on the Word of God. Witherspoon was an economist, and I'll mention this briefly. Sometimes his influence on the economic area outlasted his other things. His book, The Essay on Money, was in print longer than any of his other works. He emphasized a sound currency. And if you remember the history of the American Revolution where the printing presses were turned on and inflation wrecked the economy of the country, you would know that there was a great deal of wisdom in Witherspoon's prescription. He criticized price mandates where prices would be fixed by the army or by the government, bad idea. He encouraged free market approaches. He stressed repayment of debts. In fact, you get a sense of a good Scotsman at work emphasizing these kinds of principles. But the thing I, I really want to talk about, I'll say a few words about Witherspoon the churchman and then close with his work as an evangelist. Witherspoon was influential in organizing the modern Presbyterian church, organizing a truly national church. He wrote the founding principles for the book of church order for the new national denomination. And it reflects a commitment to religious freedom that I think is born out of his experience with the ecclesiastical tyranny in Scotland. He was moderator of the First General Assembly, and at that First General Assembly, he noted that so many of the delegates, so many of the ministers, were ones that he had trained. He had a tremendous impact on the church. And I won't go through these founding principles. I think they're worthwhile to look at but you'll notice language here that's familiar in the Presbyterian Book of Church Order, for instance, about um, delegated authority that is ministerial and declarative and the authority of scripture. There's a lot of good ecclesiastical wisdom in John Witherspoon. Now let me draw you back in closing to the dominion of providence. This was the most famous sermon during the revolutionary period, and rightly so. And it gives you a glimpse of his heart and passion more than anything else. And the reason I belabor this is that some historians have said, in Scotland he was an evangelical, but when he came across the ocean, he abandoned all of his evangelical principles. 
and, and that's just not so. The dominion of providence begins with textual exposition from Psalm 76. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. And then he has a number of points dealing with the text and the teaching of the text. And then there's doctrinal development about the implication of God's providence and how his providence works through the wrath of man. And you can see a Puritan-style outline in development, right? Textual exposition, doctrinal development, and then his application, which is first and primarily evangelistic, looking for the salvation of souls, and then secondly calling for a virtuous and consecrated people. But let me deal with the first, his evangelistic appeal. I would take the opportunity on this occasion and from this subject to press every hearer to a sincere concern for his own soul's salvation. Consider, I beseech you, the truly infinite importance of the salvation of your souls. Is it as much moment or importance, whether you and your children shall be rich or poor, at liberty or in bonds, and is it of less moment or importance, my brethren, whether you shall be the heirs of glory or the heirs of hell? Right? Starting to fight the British, independence is coming, big political things happening, and you're rightly concerned about taxes and domination and tyranny and oppression. But the things of this life are so short, you're worried about those things. What about eternity? Think about everlasting things. And then layers of conviction, and I love the language here. I do not speak this only to the heaven-daring profligate. And I just like to think about this terminology. Profligate, I understand someone who's just a, a wretch and a moral reprobate. But a heaven Daring profligate. That takes it up to another level, doesn't it? I, I don't even know. I think maybe of Lieutenant Dan in the Forrest Gump movie. You know, the hurricane's coming. He's a heaven-daring profligate. Or the groveling sensualist, right? Sensualist, I understand, but the groveling sensualist is really, really bad. Uh, but I'm not speaking just to these. To all those however decent and orderly in their civil deportment. In other words, good people, honest people, upstanding people, good citizens coming to church and saying, I'm doing fine. I'm doing good. No big problems in my life. To the decent and orderly in their civil deportment who live to themselves and have their part and portion in this life, their concerns are of this world. Nice people, but they worry about the things of this life. In fine, to all who are yet in a state of nature, for except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this is pretty direct. He's not just preaching to the reprobates and drunks. He's pe preaching to good people who need the gospel and need to be saved as well. The good people out there. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. There can be no true religion till there is a discovery of your lost state and an unfeigned acceptance of Christ Jesus as he is offered in the gospel. Unhappy are they who either despise his mercy or are ashamed of his cross. Believe it, there is no salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we must be saved. How in the world, an historian would say, that John Witherspoon left his evangelical and evangelistic principles in Scotland and just became an American political hack, I don't understand. I don't see any clearer representation of the gospel and appeal to people to come to Christ 
because eternity was at stake than what you'd find here. I wish that our politicians today would have messages like this. In fact, I wish that Presbyterian ministers across the country would have messages like this. I expect that there are a lot of people who claim the mantle of Witherspoon who are unacquainted with the gospel and are unacquainted with the call to faith in Christ, repentance and faith in Christ, and thus, in, and, and thus to eternal life. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the work of Jesus Christ. We know that we are unworthy. We know that we are sinners, and we are thankful for your free grace. We're thankful for those who have been faithful in their spheres of influence, whether as leaders of churches or leaders of state or leaders um, as preachers. And we're thankful for people like John Witherspoon who faithfully proclaimed your word. We pray that you would help us to be responsive to your word, to the call of the gospel, and that through your spirit you would quicken our hearts, enlighten our minds, and help us to be responsive to your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.